Welcome to the one within all to another episode of the Innerverse podcast. And I've been looking forward to this conversation since December. Tonight, we're going to go further into demonstrating what we've been talking about for many months. This idea of Lumashi, as it was known to the ancient Babylonian or Sumerian culture, the constellation writing, the scripture of the stars that the scribes of the priesthood have been You know, we see all the time these uh, poets that are somehow also historians. How is that? Why is that? It's because what the ancient history is really referring us to is this starry, stellar tableau of many, many, many possible variations of mixed up archetypes and uh, miracle stories, really. So back in December, we had John McHugh on the podcast to talk about the nativity of the New Testament why and how we got the two different stories of Jesus's birth in the book of Matthew and Luke, why they were different, where the details came from, was a really, really good conversation. Today, we're going to get into a subject that I find to be possibly the most fascinating aspect of the entire astrotheology, which is the Pegasus constellation and how it has morphed throughout mythologies to become everything from the river ocean to the tablet that the Quran is written upon. The ark, both as a boat and as a box, the Garden of Eden, and so much more. This celestial square in the sky tells quite a few stories, and it's going to be fascinating for John to break it down for us and show how the cuneiform writing of the ancient Sumerian and Akkadian cultures is where potentially, or maybe one of the oldest sources, maybe not the original, but definitely one of the oldest sources of this particular scripture and all the different details going on with it. So make sure that you're, uh, you know, if you really like this, make sure that you pick up the Celestial Code of Scripture by John McHugh. You can find it uh, linked in the show notes for this episode. It's probably on Amazon. You can also get it straight from his publisher. I've had a great time with this book. I reread The chapter is pertinent to the conversation today. Enjoyed that quite a bit. There's so much on the table. If only every guest was as well prepared with a PowerPoint as John is for us tonight, we're going to have so much fun. And, you know, just a little bit of John's background before we jump in. He was uh, raised Catholic, found that Christian mythos to be his pathway to the sacred, deeply spiritual guy working in a (laughs) highly atheistic field, which is, you know, archaeoastronomy. Uh, he was telling me before we got on uh, the word astrotheology is like not even allowed in some circles there. And <laughs> so yeah. to be able to come on with us to the black belt level course and go deep beyond the surface level of his knowledge and his research, I think he and I are both going to have a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone who's here live. Please help us out. Share the show to whoever you know that might like this deep gnosis. And with all that being said, can't wait to get into it. Welcome back to the podcast. John, thanks for being here, man. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Chance. Uh, and thank you so much for letting me be on <clears throat> Interverse again. Uh, I look forward to just sharing some information um, that I've been working on for the past, I guess, decade. Uh, well, actually more than a decade, but uh, that has been published in various uh, peer-reviewed scholarly journals um, and then eventually made it into the into the book. But it's connected to Pegasus and, you know, everybody wants even the youngest child, once they find out about a flying horse named Pegasus, they they fall in love with it. But the history of Pegasus might be more intriguing and far more serious than uh, a child's toy. Uh, and I, I hope we can, can dip, dip into that. Um, so I also want to say to you, as I said to you before we went on, um, in the 
the streams I swim in with astronomers all around me and linguists all around me, they're mostly atheists. And uh, I'm very spiritual. My, my language to the sacred is Catholic, but, but I connect to all of it. Paganism, I connect to Islam, I connect to Judaism, I connect to Buddhism, with, uh, all forms of uh, European paganism, Wicca. And, uh, but, but the language, the lingo is just Catholic, but the, it's, it's the same language in whatever spiritual tradition you feel most comfortable in. There's, there's similar similarities all over. So, so uh, having said that, um, I'm so glad to be here. And I was wondering if we can just go right into the, I made a PowerPoint for the viewers. I thought, thought they might like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. And for everyone that's catching the replay and they're listening to the audio RSS feed of the show, I think you'd get more out of it if you popped over to the YouTube or the Rockfin Odyssey bit shoot, wherever you might want to see the, you know, screen that John's going to be putting up for us here. His PowerPoints are very well done, uh, but I do think you'll be able to get the gist of what we're talking about just listening. But, you know, consider this your invitation to jump onto the video. And if you aren't checking out the live shows when they're live, there's such a vibrant community here that I see them all chatting, saying nice and supportive and fun things to each other. Everybody's getting it super high amount of love here. Now, what <laughs> what you just said, though, before we jump into your slides, I do want to. But I like to reiterate this point lately, how we may often in this show and me particularly put a lot of emphasis on the sameness between all these different systems and mythologies. Now that doesn't make it, it doesn't invalidate the uniqueness of any particular culture's expression of the mysteries, the morality, the aesthetic, you know, the cultural difference in terms of what you have to do to survive in one part of the world versus another. There's plenty of difference and variation in all of that. But I think when we get down to the core of like, what is, what is it that, what is the mythology coming from? It's the sky father. It's the, you know, almost the fractality of the as above, so below alchemical idea that you can see the whole sky at once. And in some strange way, it becomes a technology to access our innate capacity to know things as spiritual creatures, as children of our creator or the universe, or however you like to conceptualize that. So if, Every being has access to the same as above. I mean, not completely the same, different regions of the world see different constellations, yes, but there is this wholeness aspect to the sky that really does connect all of us and it gives us a navigatory capacity through the world and through our psyche, more than just the ability to get on a boat and know where you're at in the middle of the wide ocean. This as above is a technological language I mean, technology means language originally before it was applied to electronics. It is the technology of the sacred. These are the terms of art for probing the depths of our inner world. And in that sense, the inner world, the all is one, is in some degree going to be the same and syncretizable to all peoples everywhere because we share more in common than we have different. It just is what it is. Yeah. You can paint a million paintings, but it's always going to be the same seven color palette. And that's humanity. So excited to get into your slides, man. But you, you, if you want to respond to that before I bring them up, that's yeah. all good. Yeah, no, it, it's it's so true. It's there's a ubiquitous uh, spiritual connection between all of us. It's it's just inherent. And um, all human beings looked at the same stars. Now, they may have given them different names. And as you talked about living in different parts of the world with different seasonality, rainy seasons, dry seasons, deserts. Uh, rainforests, um, they, they may have had different uses in different cultures, and the constellation titles may be different, but the same practice of looking at the divine in the stars uh, is, is ubiquitous to all human beings. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Are we get, so we're going to start with the, the Iku constellation, or are we going to start yeah. with some Easter stuff? Yeah. I, I'll, uh, let me... I got it all weaved in, if you don't mind. Okay, it. beautiful. All right. I'm yeah, just going to let so, you take it away and uh, try yeah. not to interrupt too much. Yeah, so uh, we you were fascinated with, back when I got your email, you were fascinated with the Yaku constellation, which I am. Um, but it's involved in so many different, you know, myths, religious myths. And, you know, remember, myths is 
a modern term in a scientific world. If you were part of the culture, you would have believed that story as a, at least having an archetypal truth, if not a literal truth. But there's so many uh, connections to the to the Yaku constellation. It's called the Pegasus Square that I could barely fit it in on the title. So I'm like, Yaku, how the sacred celestial field morphed into a flying horse, a river god that encircles the earth, the Garden of Eden, Noah's Ark, and a celestial tablet named al Quran. And that's just the greatest hits. <laughs> yeah, there's more, <laughs> but yeah. we'll leave them out, you know? So, so hey, John, said, real quick, I want to tell you something, too. Um, this is alive and well still today. I happened to rewatch the film Avengers, the first oh, yeah. one, the Marvel yeah. comics. Yeah. The very beginning of the film, they're dealing with this tesseract which is like a fourth dimensional hypercube that gives sure. the wielder godlike powers and all that well the secret intelligence agency program where they're working on this tesseract cube square is called the pegasus project oh well, there you go it's like there it somebody is. knows in hollywood <laughs> somebody knows this right yeah well i well maybe they're watching so <laughs> So uh, having said that, uh, I did. I do want to touch on. Uh, of course, it's in the. I gotta plug this thing for monkfish. Plug it. Yeah. So it's a celestial code of scripture. The subtitle is the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. It just basically so, shows that the 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 stories that we call we, we recorded as miracles in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and pagan religious mythology actually have templates as pictures in the stars. When you look at the earliest can you, the, the earliest titles, which is cuneiform, cuneiform is a very uh, polysemous script. Every cuneiform sign has different readings and means different words. When you write down all the meanings, you get all the myths. They just start showing up, and you're like, "Whoa, the, this is this is the original uh, hard drive of scriptures." Is the only way I can describe it, you know, it's what it feels like. So, but yeah, um, you can't really understate the po polysemy, yeah. po polysemy, polysemy, yeah, polysemy the multiple yeah. meanings in the cuneiform is, yeah. uh, you know, we have that in English, but we're talking to a degree of magnitude, like a factor of 10 compared to the English, how one word might mean lots of different things, depending on context in English. Yeah. It's like, you know, dial that up to the max with yeah. cuneiform. Yeah, and and that's the hardest part of this presentation. I'm gonna I'm gonna do everything I can to not be boring, okay, and pedantic. So I'm gonna zip through it and try to be as you know chatty as possible. Um, but we I don't have analogies in English, and that's the dilemma. We do, we just don't write in and communicate in an alphabetic script the way uh, Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians did in cuneiform. So. But before we do that, I, I just wanted to point something out. We're coming up on Easter, and I, I, I'm i not trying to get denominational here at all. But, um, you know, I don't think people realize that Easter is celebrated on the, it's on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. It's about as pagan as you can get. Um, and uh, because, you know, my other specialty is uh, Native American uh, rock art. So... When I go in the field as an archaeologist, I'm almost always either documenting or analyzing uh, Native American pictographs and petroglyphs for celestial meaning uh, connected to uh, solstice alignments, equinox alignments, um, and other calendrical uh, important dates uh, for the, especially the main culture I study are what's called the Fremont people. Uh, Today, we call them the Ancestral Pueblo. And in some books that you've read, you may have heard of them as the Fremont or the, the Anasazi, a little bit further th further south. But anyway, so uh, I I just, because I'm around sacred petroglyphs all the time. So there's these calendrical times when you have these hierophanies on earth. And when these, it's, it's a hierophany is when the sacred manifests itself, numinous God, whatever word you want to use for that manifests on earth in front of you. And you see it frequently uh, uh, at certain moments throughout the, the year. Uh, and there's a, you can see a pictograph there from about a thousand uh, AD and 
near Dinosaur National Monument. And there's a Zuni Pueblo sun priest, and there's a picture of a, of a Kiva there, which is basically an underground church for the Pueblo Indians. They're the main peoples I study, but um, so celestial, celestial horophonies are like they're calendrical moments when the divine is present with us on earth. That's a that's the summer solstice. So this headdress of this pictograph, it's about a thousand years old, lights up. That is a non-literate culture, and it lights up on, on, at, the, at the summer solstice. You know, it's clearly marking the summer solstice, and there's a picture of it right there. Um, but so it's what we often overlook today, especially in this, you know, very secular world we live in. Um, it's these moments when, when human prayers are amplified. So if you're trying to build something, create something special in your spirit, in your heart, in your relationship, uh, in, in your family, in your friends, in your work, uh, you might want to pay attention to these times. And here's an example. of So this marks uh, the turning point of the, the sun at the winter solstice. This is at Fremont Indian State Park. You can see a dual sun right there. It's a little moon down to the right, crescent moon. But it, it's marking the uh, the the winter solstice, you had to turn the sun god, the winter solstice, or everyone would freeze to death. That's what Stonehenge's main purpose was, praying to the sun, being present with the sun, and saying, hey, we need you to turn now. Please, we beg you. Get, yeah, they get, considered it a different, an entirely different sun. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the, the Pueblo Indians don't consider it a different sun, but they, they know that this time of the year is crucial to do the proper prayers so that this, the sun continues to move in its pattern. If it goes out of balance, we're all done. I want to make a quick commentary on hierophanies, yeah. <laughs> that word, yeah. just to help people understand it a little bit, because it's probably, it's a 50 yeah. cent word. They probably yeah, never seen it. Right? Yeah, so you have hierophany. Yeah. Hierophany. It just means uh, when, when the sacred manifests, in the human world, in the physical world in front of you, you can see it. And you're looking at one right there in that uh, pictograph. We call it this, the, the solstice God is it's all we could come up with. We don't know the language of the Fremont people. I've got some inklings as to what it was, but um, but that that is one. And actually we did it, my, I'm, I'm a, the lead archeologist for the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project. And that's my other life. I do nothing but Native American rock art. Um, so that might be a future show. But oh, it has to be. Yeah. So, but, hydro um, is like the word hero, hero yeah. or eros. So that's yeah. usually the being that is the savior, deity, son of God, who yeah. does typically in the mythos manifest in a human form. And yeah. then the fannies at the end, the second half, the fan or the fin. That's like the same idea as like profane. The fan, the phantom or the phantom is the yeah. the temple. So profane would be outside the temple, but that fan, P-H-A-N or F-A-N, yeah. it shows up, uh, you know, that's a linguistic route to pay attention for. You'll see it in Finn or like in uh, the Irish and Celtic, the Fenians was what they called the Phoenicians who were oh, sailing yeah. around and giving all these ideas around. So the ph Phoenicians, the fa fawn of Phoenicians is also a similar idea. I uh, just wanted to help people understand that word a little bit you have eros and then fan yeah <laughs> so it's like the uh the holy the holy eros or savior in a way yeah and and it's right in front of you it, it, it's manifest in front of you and i go to this site every year um for for obvious reasons but um see it somebody just wrote in the uh in the uh chat that it means sun and <laughs> that's a that's an appropriate term uh, I, I think of, uh, soul as sun, but that's Latin. Um, well, there's a lot of words for the most yeah. important, uh, yeah. celestial yeah. object. And it's got yeah. like the Phoenix Phoenix is obviously a solar symbol of that oh, yeah. equinoctial re resurrection yeah. or, um, yeah. and all that. So it's got the same root in it as well, but we don't have to hang up on yeah. that. I know you have a lot of slides. I just, yes. I like that word and I wanted to spend a moment on it. Please, yeah, no, it was wonderful you did. And so, yeah, so there's a turning of the sun at the winter solstice. And, you know, these had to go through. I, I'm not just making this up. Like, these had to go through peer review and everything. This one was in American Indian rock art from, like, 2021. 
did an article on it. Um, but this, the, I also want to emphasize the sacred direction. So, you know, um, we think of north, south, east, and west. In, in, in the uh, Native American world, the directions are sacred. Um, and they're not exactly north, south, east, west as we see them. They're, they're, they're northeast, southeast, uh, southwest, and northwest. And they connect with the summer solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset, the equinoxes, and then the winter solstice sun. Mostly it's those sunrise and sunsets at the solstices. They were the boundary lines of the sacred um, uh, and uh when you did your prayers in, in Native American spiritual belief. So, and there's a picture of a kiva. It's basically an underground uh, ceremonial church uh, in the Pueblo Indian religion. Um, the Pueblo Indians, they live along the Rio Grande now, and uh, you've got the Hopi Mesas, you have Zuni Pueblo, Acoma Pueblo. Um, so most of them build kivas, these, these circular semi-underground. When you see a circular structure and it's partially on the ground, it's very likely it's Kiva. You enter and leave from a ladder. Um, but and so even when they make their altars on the floor in those Kivas, they're aligning them to the summer solstice, sunrise, sunset, winter solstice, sunrise, sunset. Um, so what I'm suggesting is when you when you do your prayers, you might want to make that alignment to amplify your prayers uh, for people in the universe who do offerings and and try to connect with the sacred. Um, and again, the other suggesting prayer times, Native Americans always pray to the rising. Any traditional Native American does a little prayer and offering at sunrise and at sunset. And if you can, when it's directly over can, overhead, we would call it astronomically, we call it solar noon. Um, yeah, but, the juice is right there in the middle. That's why yeah. the uh, savior of the Trinities is the mediator between mm. the God, the Father and mankind. Mediator means the middle. So those moments of liminal transitional space, sunset, sunrise, or right in the middle of the day, solar noon, those are symbolically, you know, you have more of an, a, a shot of getting a word in through the mediator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, Native Americans actually do uh, major uh, uh, rituals at, they call uh, bringing down the sun when it's directly overhead. They're trying to bring down the sacred when you have that, power coming at its most forceful and it's in between its rising point, its setting point, like you just said, Chance. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, again, it's to, it's trying to align yourself with the idea that your life is connected to that picture. If that goes out of balance, it's over, you know, um, and I think we forget that. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out. But the other piece to it is um, so that Native Americans, uh, you know, the calendar is actually kept. In fact, um, the crescent moon is it's very much like Islam, where the, the, the visible waxing crescent moon starts the month, then it moves to full, then it moves to waning. There's the idea that if you're doing constructive work in your life, if you're trying to build something, you want to do your prayers during a waxing moon towards full. Praying for the two days during the two days of the full moon is often... Uh, great for trying to, for any kind of fertility or fecundity. And then if you're trying to get rid of something or jettison something or destroy something about yourself that you don't like, then you want to, you want to do your prayers in a, in a waning towards a waning crescent. Um, as the, you know, the moon's getting smaller and it starts appearing over the Eastern horizon. So notice I, I put little moons there right on the outsides of the summer solstice and the winter solstice. So there, so, um, so about eight, every 18.61 years, the, the, the moon usually, so, you, so if you woke up and you watched the sun at the summer solstice, you'd see it rise, go to the winter solstice, come back in 365 days. Well, the moon has a cycle too, but the cycle is 18.61 years. So, and there's a small, small period of time every 18.61 years when the moon actually rises and sets beyond the limits of the sun, about five degrees north and about five degrees south. It's called the major lunar standstill. And there it is over Chimney Rock in southwestern Colorado. That's the, the rising moon. I think this is 2006 was the last time we had a major lunar standstill. That Pueblo, which was built in like around 
1050 AD, the Pueblo there is meant to align and make it align with this event. Um, so at Fremont Indian State Park, where I happen to do a lot of work in Utah, um, we found this pendant. It's only about a little bigger than a half dollar. But if you notice, it's got crescent on the right, a central hole, and then a crescent on the left. It's got 13 uh, little, I've marked them in there for you, 13 little, uh, what look like little circles, and then 19 etchings. It, it's very likely that this is a lunar pendant marking the lunar phases, just like on the front of your Interverse podcast. You know what I mean? They have the, the moons marked off, right? On the starts on the right. Pueblo, for, just to make a long story short, Pueblo people typically do their rock art right to left, almost like Hebrew and Arabic. Um, so you have your waxing crescent. You got your full moon is the, the circle in the middle. And then you have your waning crescent. 13 moons is actually what occur. The beginning of a 13th moon occurs every year because the lunar cycle is 11 days shorter than the solar cycle. So every year you have 12 full lunations and then the beginning of a 13th moon, about one third of a 13th moon. And it's shown there in that pendant. And then the 19 is connected to that 19 year, the 19 years it takes to mark the major lunar standstill. So uh, I just found that pendant really interesting. I want to share it with oh, you. Oh, that's it's awesome. Yeah, and it's probably made by someone like, this is the Pequin. This is, Pequin just means it's the sun priest at the Zuni Pueblo from 1896. So before... Um, I'll just say too, it, the right to left, Bustrophodon style, mm -hmm. it's not like uh, evidence, but it is a point in the column of similarity to the Phoenician alphabet. And they were yeah. sailors. I mean... Somebody yeah. took information around the world. I don't know who it was. We don't yeah. have a good na name for that culture other than calling them holy sailors, but yeah. there's a link there. There was a, uh, a great scholar named Barry Fell from Harvard. I think he was an oceanographer, and he, he wrote about connections between uh, Europe and the Middle East and that are found in America that you just don't hear about in history books. You're like, you're not going to get that published. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anyway... Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so we have, we've just had the vernal equinox. And so uh, the first full moon after the vernal equinox is on April 6th and 7th. So if you're uh, active in your prayer life and your spirit life, be a great time to do a ceremony with your family, your friends, uh, and, and, and really try to amplify whatever you're trying to create in your life on uh, April 6th and 7th. Trying to have a baby, great time. Uh, stuff like that. So anyway, uh, I just want to share that with you um, because it matters to me. And I, I believe me, I don't get to talk about that in in uh, my archaeoastronomy circles. I get, I'll never publish again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. You know, Easter is definitely a pagan thing. Just that word. Like, I know that you're hip to some of the ways that letters yeah. don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one equivocal translation between yeah. languages and so with the, the letter s sometimes you see s become st uh -huh. as a sound and yeah. so easter is also like easter or acer or icer the uh etruscans of italy pre-roman civilization they called the top god icer spelled like the same way that the uh norse spell the aesir which is their gods. The Druids had a system of emanations from a single god that was called the yeah. Easter. <laughs> you know, so all those words are basically Easter. And then yeah. not to mention what most people connected to, Ishtar. So yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Goes around the whole, the, yep. Everywhere has got a version of this almost. Yeah, and it's incredibly pagan. So, you know, again, if you're pagan, if you're Catholic, you're pagan. And if you're pagan, you're Catholic. And so uh, anyway, that that ubiquity of humanity and our spiritual connections, I think, is really a bond that we we need to really focus more on instead of focusing on our differences. We need to focus on our yeah. similarities, you know. Um, but that's what we're here to talk about tonight. There's that little box. There's our little coup, right? So this is from the this is a sketch from the calendar of Dendera in Egypt. Uh, it's, you know, uh, so for whatever reason, the Egyptians don't show Pegasus. They 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 adopt the uh, the uh, Mesopotamian zodiac that makes its way into Greece, 
Um, you get Greco-Roman Egypt uh, in about 60 BC. They build the, I believe it's about, uh, this temple was built in about 60 BC. It was finished in the early date, like, like 20 AD or something like that. But you can see the square. It's an, it's a field. It's an irrigated field. It's straddled by Pegasus. I mean, excuse me, by uh, Pisces, obviously. Uh, and it's not a flying horse. Um, so the question then becomes, you know, how did this field, this sacred field, was what the original four stars that we call the Pegasus Square, how did it suddenly morph into a flying horse? And then we'll see that it's the Garden of Eden. Um, it's definitely the uh, the arc of the Gilgamesh epic flood story and the Bible. And it's also uh, possibly um, the uh, the idea of where the, the Quran being a celestial tablet kept in heaven. It's all embedded in that constellation. And that's what I was trying to unpack tonight. Yeah, and that's this is so important. Like, for example, people have brought up in Greece, you can't see Canopus, who is like the navigator of the Argo constellation, which is usually where people yeah. point and say that's the Ark. But as with everything astrotheological, there's redundancy built in. <laughs> you yeah. know, maybe you don't see a certain constellation in one part of the world, but they have a version of it encoded somewhere else. It's like it's like redundancies is the best way I could describe it. So, like I, you know, after yeah. reading your work and and seeing how well it syn syncretizes with other research the uh eco field being the arc actually in a lot of ways is more fitting than the constellation that is currently called argo you know yeah yeah and so i mean that's the, the whole flood story is a whole nother that was my master's thesis i think it was called uh the, the biblical deluge uh a, a mythical event projected onto the constellation or a historic event projected onto the constellations I went to Br i'm not mormon but i went to brigham young university uh because they have a great native american studies program and they also have a great linguistic program so i got to do both and um but they made me say a historic event projected onto the constellations because uh the that event in uh in Christian belief system has to be historic. It doesn't have to be a global flood, but it has to be the idea of a powerful destructive flood that was aggrandized into the story of Noah. So anyway, um, but so, yeah, and it, these are just the articles that they're, you know, they were peer reviewed and that's how it ended up in the Celestial Code of Scripture. Um, but the yeah, people will screenshot the list of articles if they want to find more. Yeah, I, they're I just, if you just Google search to, those, you'll find them. Yeah, so you, they're in, they're listed in the Celestial Code of Scripture and the, the bibliography at the end. But so, so the, what the what the Celestial Code of Scripture is really doing is it's trying to expose. I, I really want I don't want to sound like you know self-aggrandizing or anything because I'm just a mediocre scholar, but I ask very different questions because you know I I couldn't reconcile the historic idea of miracles and uh in science i just couldn't do it until i found all this and then i was like oh i see there's a whole nother system here and um so it's the idea that the constellations that we see in the sky are still frames of you know momentous or monumental archetypal events that once occurred on earth um and that when you take these stellar pictures you see pictures of miracles and then when you write down the cuneiform titles uh, for the constellations in each stellar tableau, those, because of the, the alternate readings for each cuneiform sign, you end up getting the myths that show up in the pagan world and the Judaic world and the Christian world and the Islamic world. And that's what the book's about. And so it looks like the authors of religious history are the what we would call the, the magi, the the magi that show up at this uh, and follow the star of Bethlehem to the birth site of Jesus. They're Babylonian astrologers. I know a lot of people call say that they're Persian, but by the time that story was written in the, uh, in the first century, the word Magui in Greek, or Magus in Greek, um, it, it, it referred to a, a Babylonian astronomer astrologer. 
it, it was a you're you're a priest. You're not just an astronomer. You're you're literally an inter interlocutor with the heavenly gods. That's what you did. Um, and we I don't think a think big that thing today. that's missing from our understanding is the way that information was flowing between these magi of different cultures. And so what, like how I currently conceive of it is that somebody at some point, some culture were, were they priests? Were they merchants? Was it some of both took the idea of the constellations as a, a sacred tool, a navigatory tool around to many different places and then imparted the wisdom of what you what we would call Dumashi from the Sumerian side, the yeah. constellation writing, that there's actually a text up there and you can decode it. And that's where you can get knowledge of the world from or wisdom from. Yeah. And then different cultures took that and ran with it from there. And so they they start coming up with their own myths. There's some similar a lot of similarities and overlap because they maybe had the same starting point or template, something like that. But then there's also this east to west uh thing going on on the continent that is very difficult to parse out but you know mesopotamia the word that we get for the part of the, of the middle east that get where babylon and sumeria and uh phoenicia <laughs> all of that is yeah. kind of in that area of the off the mediterranean on the east side M meso means middle mm. pot or po those are both names you know, some of the 10,000 names of Buddha. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. You know? yeah. And there's even like, mm. there's even some accepted mainstream history regarding the Greco Buddhist empire. How, Interesting, huh? you know, Buddhism, yeah. it, I won't say it's the original thing, but there's, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, like somebody taking it from Europe to the East, someone taking it from the East back to Europe <laughs> and then back again. And I don't know how many times the telephone game has been played, yeah. but there is something there that like, you know, it, it, it's Buddhism all the way down in, in a sense. Yeah, interesting. Uh, there, there's a lot of trade between uh, the Indus Valley in India and Mesopotamia. Um, so um, that whole Indus Valley civilization um, in, in India is, is a, a really strong connection with Mesopotamia. And I, anyway, I, you know, I'm just... Another know, example, like the Magi were called Umanu. Is that right? Is that how you say Umanu, that? Yeah, Umanu. And, uh, Umanu. Yeah. So you have Om, mm. <laughs> the sacred yeah. Om, and Manu yeah. or Menu yeah. or many different variations of that word is the sacred lawgiver in so many cultures, in so many places, yeah. a version of that word. Manus, Manu, Menu, Minos, it goes on. And so like that right. word for Magi, um, Umanu, is like the lawgivers of Ohm, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, yeah. that's pretty much their job description. So that's a fascinating word too. For yeah, Magi. And, and so that what I'm, you know, the theory is that that uh, every culture had their own version of the Magi, and they would read their sacred history from these stellar picture stories, these archetypal stories, um, and so, um, so you know. I already touched on this, but you, the pagan narratives that are embedded in um, in the Aku constellation have to do with Pegasus uh, emerging from the springs of the god Ocean. And, you know, the idea that the god Ocean is described as a river that encircles the world. And you're like, wait, he's the ocean, but he's in river form and he circles the earth. Where'd you get that one? There's nothing on earth that looks like that. Um, and I'll show you how they, they read it in the stars. Um, and then there's other biblical stories. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden story. Uh, we'll talk about the Ark being the, uh, the Aku being the, uh, the Gilgamesh epic, tablet, in Tablet 11, the flood story of the Gilgamesh epic. The Ark is literally the Aku constellation. <laughs> like it says, build yourself an Aku constellation. So I'm like, okay, I think this might be a celestial myth. Uh, and then there's a claim uh, throughout Islam that the Quran is written on a celestial tablet and kept in heaven. And I have some ideas about that. I think you'll find intriguing. So there it is. Uh, so Pegasus, a flying horse whose appearance is cut off at the navel. And just so your readers are aware, when when you sit and look at look up in the sky nor, and you've got north at your back, south, say you're lined up north, south, Pegasus shows up so upside down. So north is the bottom of your screen, south is the top of your screen. Um, 
So yeah, so if Pegasus, yeah. which can also symbolize navigating by night for a seafaring people, yeah. if it's cut off at the navel, yeah. exact same as the mythos of the ark being mm. cut off at the prow. Yeah. And there's a, there's other a lot of stories in Samaria talking about that as well. There's another concept. Well, I, I can go. I can do another show on that if you want. But, <laughs> but anyway, so the the thing that's interesting about Pegasus, he first shows up in Hesiod um, about 700 BC. So he's described. You know, he's the flying horse. He's he springs forth from the severed head of Medusa. Perseus cuts off Medusa's head. You see it. It's a picture in the stars. It's it's one of our constellations. And then Pegasus flew away and left the earth and came to the deathless gods, which means Pegasus flew up into the sky. They never say anything about wings. Pegasus just flew up into the sky after getting uh, uh, emerging from uh, Medusa's severed head. This is very likely Pegasus's catasterism. Catasterism just means it's a term for placing among the stars. It explains the monumental or archetypal event that allowed a certain constellation to enter into immortality in heaven in this in the celestial realm um and it's very it's interesting to me because it's as if he's hesiod also realizes that pegasus is a constellation as he's writing in about 700 bc and homer doesn't mention pegasus but uh hesiod does and hesiod's a late contemporary of Homer. Homer's probably between 750 and 700 BC, and Hesiod's later in that that time frame. So one of the things that's interesting about Hesiod is he relies on the Babylonian epic of creation called Enuma Elish. All of his themes come right out of Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian and Assyrian creation story. It's their epic of creation, right? Um, and it's Enuma Elish is definitely one of the, uh, uh, it's the uh, Vede Mecum. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reference manual. It's a handbook of all of the Mesopotamian astrologers. It's all, that's, they use Enuma Elish, especially Tablet 7, and I'll show you why in a sec. And so if, if Hesiod is relying on the themes in Enuma Elish, it presupposes that he's got some astronomical information at his fingertips that is Mesopotamian. He might even have be a Mesopotamian, might even have a Mesopotamian tutor. He might even be a Mesopotamian. And we'll go into that a little bit later. But um, so, so I'm just going to go in. So not only is Pegasus born from the severed head of Medusa, but so is Crusar. Uh, it's the golden sword. He's a golden sword deity. Right. And uh, and remember, Pegasus is born um, literally near the springs of the God Ocean. And that's where this birth occurs. So, you know, you're looking around and you're like, well, there's Mesopotamia. You can see it over there on the right. As you talked about uh, so eloquently earlier, Phoenicia, where I circled there, is where the so somehow more than half of the Mesopotamian constellations show up in the Greek world. Nobody knows how. And I think I know how. And that's what the book goes in. The book goes into that a bit. But the the old theory was, well, there were traders meeting up in Phoenicia and they just exchanged ideas. They exchanged, uh, uh, you know, um, sailing techniques and constellations that they used to guide their ships. And I'm not saying that that's not how they some of the constellations made it. But as you'll see in a few more slides, there's a much simpler explanation. Um, so so to get back into Mesopotamia, so um, so Mesopotamian astrologers are one of these, uh, we, we would call them magicians today, but they're, uh, they're a manu, they're scholars, they're experts. They're, they are called sorcerers by the, the Christians and the, and the Jews. They're called um, you know, magicians as well. And they included um, astronomers. And when I use the term astronomer or astrologer, it's the same word. I just don't feel like saying astronomer, astrologer every time. So they're astrologers, div just straight up diviners, exorcists, physicians, and lamentation channers, the people who had to control and soothe angry gods. And when you use the term umanu, 
it could mean that you had one of those skills, but in reality, most Dumanu had all of them. They were, they could do them all. So they knew they were exorcists. They were physicians. They knew what herbs to give you. They they knew how to the prayers that were needed and the offerings needed to soothe angered gods to make it rain. Um, they could predict the future. They could uh, predict you know. Uh, uh, well, they wanted they wanted everyone to think they could predict the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's yeah, they're the therapeutae yeah, in yeah. Egypt, the whole the healer, miracle workers, yeah. healers. This is literally what Christianity comes from. One hundred percent. Interest. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's definitely true. And so, what's interesting about the title of an astronomer in Mesopotamia? Uh, remember, remember, there the word umanu just means expert or scholar, right? But the the exact title is Tupsharu, and Tupsharu is, it, it literally means writer, uh, an author is what it means. And it comes from the idea that that these, they, they are just linguists par excellence. They control Sumerian, they control Akkadian, um, they, uh, they probably know another language, maybe Aramaic, um, and they're, what, what they're really studying though is they're studying these Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries. And that's where all the polysemy shows up, the multiple meanings on a word or phrase, which is what polysemy means. It's just a I like it because it's so accurate. Polysemy just means multiple meanings in a word or a phrase. And, and in cuneiform, it's astonishing uh, when you see how you write in cuneiform and how polysemy starts to show up. So. So Tupsharu, it's an astrologer, it's an astronomer, and it literally means a writer. And so it's the idea that it comes from, the, the reason they're called writers is because these astrologers viewed the, the, the starry sky as heavenly writing. Shitir Shameh, Shitir Burume, Shitir Tishamami. Um, they're, they're just forms of celestial writing, heavenly writing, have writing of the sky is how you could translate all the and all three of those. Um, there's a picture of the Magi going to G, following the star of Bethlehem to Jesus' birth. Um, so, but these two Tupsharo, they studied and edit, edited. They wrote, I mean, the, the author of the Gilgamesh epic is an exorcist, you know, which implies it's an, he knew astrology as well. Um, they write the tale of Atrahasis, which is the earliest creation story and flood story. They write Enuma Elish, uh, which is the Babylonian Assyrian uh, epic of creation. And what they're studying are these Sumerian and Akkadian dictionaries. And I'll, I'll show you what they are in a minute. But again, we all can figure out the prognostication piece. It comes from the idea that the stars can allow you to predict what's going to occur on Earth in the future. Now, we apply that horoscopically today to personally benefit ourselves. But in the ancient world, this was done to um, guide the king or queen, the rulers in the land that had to make the best decisions for the community. Which um, is why, you know, the top king, chief of the priests, all that, they're also a judge. In the Old Testament, they're yeah. often just referred to as judges. Yep. Interestingly, judges. the word judge you know, used to linguistically even be a, a definition of the word God with a lowercase g. Yeah. God meant magistrate, prince, judge, ruler. Yeah. So we get this term, I think a really good term for it, judicial astrology. Yep. But uh, it's fascinating to consider that this was bi-directional. The future, yeah. yes, but also this is how you create the uh, supporting foundational narrative of your quote, ancient history, unquote, to justify yeah. the existence of your empire or your dynasty. Yeah. And and that's, you know, and that's what I try to go into. So, and that's where we start touching on the Lamashi writing. So they have this other form of writing. writing. It's kept pretty secret. It's only mentioned by Esarhaddon, Assyrian King Esarhaddon. He's, he's, a, he's ruling around 680 BC. And he says, he, he's got this stone monument and he said, I wrote my name in constellation writing and they're like wait you wrote your name in constellation writing that implies a whole system of constellation writing you can't just make it up and do it ad hoc like um and his grandfather his uh 
temples and his uh, palace has what looks like constellation images as a form of writing. So it's the idea that wordplay as revelation, you know, so when you find a pun in a constellation title and you find a secondary meaning, you found new information about that constellation, that divine being that's up there in the stars doing something. So the idea, I, I just always like this one because it, it resonates most people in America if they haven't been raised in a tradition foundation, they're familiar with the idea that at some point, you know, you know, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to Peter, he says, you are rock, you're Petros, rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church, right? And the Roman Catholic Church identifies this as the, the, the foundation for the papal office. So our pope, you know, the Catholic pope is based on a pun. That's pretty serious when you think about it. You know, it's not George Carlin stuff. It's, you know, it's it's serious wordplay um, because it was believed you know, wordplay that around the word rock and ancient words for rock is also a really big part of this story, too. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to see that word, uh, sir, show up in this IQ decode. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that was, for example, Phoenicia, the capital of Phoenicia for a time was the city sir which is spelled for some reason in english t-y-r-e so most people are saying tire but it's yeah. sir so that's rock that's lord that's the head yeah. you know it's uh the latin petros yeah but yeah that word the rock is, is super important for yeah. you know the rock star that's the, yeah. the king or the savior or the messiah or the head priest yeah it, yeah so cella the term cella comes up um in aramaic Solid, I believe, means rock. But so another thing that starts to show up with these Amanu and especially with the astrologers is <coughs> references. You'll see the term Amat Nitzirti, hidden words, and then connected to some idea of Parish Tu Shaili, which means secrets of the gods. They're tipping their hands. They're saying they're only they're they're writing back and forth for each other, but they're saying, yeah, you find a hidden word, you find a pun, you find a homonym, a homophone synonym or double entendre and you found a secret of a deity that no one else knew about and it's important so when you find one you keep it secret the uninitiated shall not know this this is secret information amongst the omanu the scholars right so one of the great scholars of uh punning in the ancient world is scott nogo and he i'm just going to just read the major stuff here so the earliest writing is cuneiform and um Part of the reason that punning was so important, and it's that writing was considered of a divine origin. Puns provided the diviners which in, with interpretive strategies, and those diviners included the astrologers. Words were considered the embodiment of the object or the idea that represented. We think of it as DNA, but in the ancient world, it was actually the, the name itself. That's why it was, when you were given a name, it was, it was a characteristic of who you were and who your personality was. Yeah, in the I, version yeah. of the system, they called the name the Ren. It's your Ren, which is a layer of your body. It's actually one of the bodies that you exist within simultaneously, like yeah. layers of the shell. It very interesting. Yeah, and that that makes perfect sense. Um, and when it gets to cuneiform, it, it's from the idea. Well, you see it in Hebrew as well, and you know all the biblical languages, but individual words contain the power of essence. And what's crucial here is there was a whole envelope of information that came with every cuneiform sign or part of a word. That's, we don't have that. That's the stuff that I kind of, that's always so hard to explain. And I just do my best. And so where it comes from is the idea that um, the reason cuneiform writing is so polysemous is because, you know, cuneiform writing is invented by the Sumerians and around 3000 BC, and they're, they've got kingdoms throughout southern Mesopotamia. And there's this constant influx of these Akkadian-speaking peoples that we later know as the Babylonians of southern Mesopotamia and the Assyrians of northern Mesopotamia. So they uh, end up uh, living with the Sumerians and, and in fact, kind of um, over, overtaking the Sumerians 
to the point where Sumerian dies as a spoken language at, a, as, at about, I don't know, 1800 BC. And then from that point on, it's retained as the sacred language of science and literature. Um, and but the Akkadian speaking peoples retain Sumerian in their everyday writing through these things called Sumerian logograms. And again, we, we just, <laughs> there's just not many analogies. So I'll give it a shot here. So, so there's about 600 signs in the cuneiform writing system, right? And um, everyone has a sign name, just like the letter A, B, C. The letter B says B, but the name is B, right? The letter A is named A, but it says A. Ah. Like, so, well, they have 600 of those. And the difference is they have different readings. So this is just one of the more popular ones. An just means, in Sumerian, it means sky. And it can also be read Dingir, which just means deity or God. So the Babylonians and the Assyrians, the Akkadian speakers, they, they adopt this Sumerian writing system and they retain thousands and thousands of words using Sumerian logograms. Here, here's our closest analogy. And then you have On. On is the yeah. solar deity at Heliopolis. And, and you have that. And I'm sure there's a connection to that. There's no way that's accidental, you know. Um, so... And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, um, so the, when they borrow it, so they have this one cuneiform sign. So you can read it. So on means Shamu in Akkadian, which is skies or heavens, and Ilu in Akkadian, which is, you know, God. Okay. So you're like, well, that's not too hard. Like I can get that. And, and then you realize that they, these, these Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries just list Sumerian logogram thousands of them and all their meanings. So An can mean Shamu, skies, heavens. It can mean Yau, which means mine or belonging to me. It can mean Kakabu, which is star. It can mean Shibultu, ear barley. It means Zukupu, which means to, to impale, you know, to impale someone on stake. It can mean Sha, which is of. It can mean Asaku, uh, taboo. Um, and uh, it can also mean Ilu, of course, God. And so, uh, so when you write that one cuneiform sign, you can get skies, heavens, mind, star, barley, ear, impaling of taboo and God. That's polysemy. That's what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. Can I offer, um, this is just conjecture on my part, but let me offer a possible, you know, pathway, how it got so convoluted would be perhaps that you have priests acting, you know, in their capacity in different areas that are sharing these language groups and they're not connected by instantaneous communication or an internet. You know, they are they have to walk to each other or ride horses. It's not a quick informational transit from one area right. to another. So at the point where you're doing your scribe thing and it's not easy or simple to chisel or, you know, impress into the clay this particular style of writing. So you're going to constantly be trying to think of ways to quicken it. <laughs> yeah. So one temple might come up with an, a usage of the on cuneiform logogram and symbol. And then another one might come up with their, what they're using as an abbreviation with that exact same symbol. And then later priests, generations later, potentially, they have these old lexicons and dictionaries and it's just kind of snowballed and they're accepting all the things that the forefathers said one thing meant as true yeah. and just trying to keep compiling and keep track of it all, you know? Yeah. And so that's, it just got bigger and bigger and snowballed more and more. Yeah. And then around 1600 BC, they're trying to preserve Sumerian. So they, they, they start to make these Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries is the only word I can, that comes to mind. Maybe a, you could think of it as a thesaurus maybe, but um, so anyway, um, so then there's a, a, a zillions of homophones. So there's so many homophones that like, you have to, you, the, the transliteration scheme, there's so many cuneiform signs that um, instead of trying to memorize 600 of them, scholars just use, you end up being an expert in a certain area of, you know, cuneiform writing. So, so they use little numbers so you know which cuneiform signs written on a tablet. So the most common cuneiform sign for mul, which just means star in Sumerian. Um, it could mean constellation if you wanted it to. Mul, there's a mul two, a mul three, a mul four, a mul five, and mul x. Mul x is the 
astrologer's esoteric form. Mul just means kakabu in Akkadian. It means star. You could also register it as a, a constellation, right? Well, the problem is that that's not too bad, but every one of those cuneiform signs has other readings. And I'm only giving you two. Like there's, some of them have like 10. And they might have 50 words attached to them. So when you write a constellation, remember every star in the sky starts with one of these mole signs. And you can just start to see the level of polysemy embedded in every constellation title. You know, mole neshu, which is, you know, the lion, you know, constellation lion. There might be 30 words embedded in that. Okay, and I'm just giving you an example. So when you write the cuneiform sign mul, those little numbers, don't worry about them. They're for this, they're so linguists and archaeologists know which cuneiform sign is being written. But so when you write mul, the Sumerian word spoken mul that means star or constellation, it can mean star, god, shining brightly, inscription, writing, arrow, foundation, ornament, piece, wood wasp, water course, distant time, fruit, feeling elated, field, cow, moon, and month. That's one. <laughs> so, so I'm not trying to. Well, it's awesome though, is to just like looking at that list, you can come up with reasons how all those ideas relate to uh, stars. <laughs> yeah. And Interestingly yeah. enough, like there is some kind of, you know, as metaphysical, allegorical relationship to all those things being constellations or stars as well. Yeah. Thinking of like the fruit, the, the stars are like the fruit of the, you know, the, the tree of life that is the the pole of the world and the North yeah. Star being the top and all that. Yeah. In fact, one of the titles for the moon is Inbu, which is fruit. It's the Akkadian word for fruit. Um, so, yeah. And again, if you find a pun, the secret of the great gods, the uninitiated shall not see it. Right. So so the, where they really enumerate the, the creation story, enumerate tablet seven, that's where they show you. I, they don't show you, they don't tell you, it's all secret. But when you see what they're doing, that's what explains how they use wordplay to unpack uh, as, as a form of revelation. So they lift, uh, so the god Marduk, Marduk is the planet Jupiter. He's, it's a, his aspect is Jupiter. He's the supreme Babylonian deity. He's got 50 Sumerian titles, uh, 50 epithets, and they're in, written in some, as Sumerian logograms. And they used these 50 epithets. They found wordplay in them to, to construct all 163 lines of a new Middle East tablet seven. And it's very uh, tangible is the best way, palpable to see how they did it. And I'll just give you one example. So new Middle East tablet seven, line 128, it says the God Nibiru is, hit. there's no word for being in Akkadian. So you have to always insert the word for being like is. His star, which in the skies they cause to appear, right? So that's how they write it in Kineaform, right? Muldin Gir Nibiru. Um, my poor man got messed up there. So star, the star god Nibiru just means crossing. It's when uh, Marduk Jupiter is crossing the middle of the sky. So that's why he got the, has the epithet Nibiru, crossing. The fjord, you could think of it as. So I hear New Agers being like, but it's planet X and it will bring the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't think Zachariah yeah, Sitchens is on the table for this examination. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not I, a fan personally. Yeah, no, I get I get people that email me about that. Uh, I do get people that email me about that. So um, so one of the ways to write, you know, uh, Nibiru is you know, it's a deity. So it's Dean Gear Nibiru. Um, that's how you spell it. Nay to be right? That's how you spell the bureau. The little numbers aren't there though. So, and you could use the mul two sign. Remember, you have you know six different mul signs to choose from, right? So one of them's mul. So literally, it says the star god Nibiru, the star god crossing, right? Well, mul two has a whole bunch of different meanings other than just star. One of them is ushapu, which means they cause to appear. Okay. Dingir, as we saw earlier, can mean Ilu God, it can mean Kakabu star, and it can be it, it can it can also be read An, which is skies. The Ne number two sign doesn't seem to be used in this pun. B can be read it, it literally is the word for his in um Sumerian logogram for his in Akkadian means shu. 
Uh, Ru stands for the word Sha, which is which, and Ina, which is in. And then they just took those words and made a coherent sentence. The guide crossing is his star, which in the skies they cause to appear. My formatting got messed up a little bit when, uh, when I pulled this up. So, but anyway, so that's how they did it. So I just was like, well, you know, I may be Polish, but I think I can figure this one out. I bet they're doing that with the other myths, you know? Um, so, so one of the things, one of the greatest New Near Eastern scholars of our times, this guy, A.R. George, right? He died recently. Uh, one of the things he says is in the ancient cuneiform scholarship, the writing of a name can be adapted to impart information about the nature and function of its bearer. Babylonian scholars, he's talking about astrologers and all the Yamana, right? Themselves were fond of the speculative interpretation of names in particular. This was not a trivial, trivial pursuit, but a means of revealing profound truth about the nature and function of the deities and their attributes. And not only that, what they did, what, what made them so special. So now all this starts, so what does Mesopotamian Lamashi writing and wordplay and punning in Numilish tab, Tablet 7 got to do with Hesiod, the first Greek author to mention Pegasus? Well, you know, there's a guy named, uh, is it Peter Walcott? I believe it's Peter Walcott. He wrote a tome on uh, Hesiod's uh, writings, especially Theogony. And he says it has striking parallels in the Cadian and Hittite texts and seems originally to have come from the Near East. And he also writes its closest companion, you know, he's talking about theogony here, right? Theogony. Its closest companions in Greek literature are the Homeric hymns, but even closer is the picture of Zeus in the theogony and that of Marduk in the Numa Elish and is to Babylonian tradition in the 8th century BC that we should resort if we wish to assess Hesiod's debt to the Near East. He says, he says, Theogony is based on a Numa Elish, is what he's saying, you know. So hostage astrologers. And right? it might be, or it might be that both were based on the same constellation writing. And it could be. You know, I think I kind of see it that way, like, because again, there wasn't mass transit of information you had to get on a boat or ride a horse or walk. So, yeah. you know, I think it made more sense to train the priests who were probably in contact with each other loosely. Yeah. And, you know, like the Masons, for example, currently, yeah. one thing that they call themselves and each other is travelers. <laughs> okay. Because I think that yeah. this, uh, you know, priesthood and temple building, they were the same guild, you know, yeah. along with yeah. probably navigators uh, sailors, all part of the same trade secrets because yep. they're all related to the uh, the sky, knowledge of the sky and wisdom. Yeah, so intimate knowledge. Of so the I sky. think that we're seeing probably, you know, we're trying to say which one was the original, who's basing what on who, but I think it simplifies the whole equation to just say they're using the same type of methodology and they're using the same text that they're translating from, the text being the sky, yep. the methodology being pun and, puns, and polysemy of their own languages. Yep. So, yeah, so um, so it, where it shows up, you talk about hostage astrologers. Daniel is definitely a hostage astrologer. He's taken by Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II. It even says in uh, verse 511 that he comes to be the supervisor of all the astrologers and all of the, the, uh, the magicians of, of uh, Babylonia. Pliny the Elder talks about slaves being taken overseas, um, and that Manilius Antiochus is the originator of our astronomy. He's one of the slaves. He came from Syria, uh, which is, you know, the Phoenician coast. Um, Zenodotus of Malus tells us that Homer was a Babylonian. He's writing in the second, first century BC. And here's where it gets funny. So Homer, me the name Homer means hostage. That's what his name is. And so he's, he twice describes uh, seagoing Phoenician slave traders in his uh, writings in the Iliad. Uh, and the Homeric hymns recount how the god Dionysius was taken by pirates as, as, a, as booty while walking on the beach. They were going to sell him for a ransom, right? So, and, you know, there, there's a Near Eastern archaeologist named Bradley Parker, and he identifies Tigales Pileser. Uh, he's an 8th century uh, Assyrian king, 
he talks about, you know, some of these Phoenician cities uh, were under the rule of the Assyrians in the eighth century. And they're having all these problems with these Greeks coming in and taking slaves, just raiding their port cities, taking as many slaves as they can and then booking out. It, that was the goal. It wasn't to like overthrow the city or try to take its wealth. It was to get as much booty as possible. And one of the best forms of booty was slaves. Um, and in a mock interview, Lucian has a mock interview with Homer. And he says to him, above all, he says, uh, where do you come from? He's talking to Homer. And Homer says, as a matter of fact, I'm a Babylonian. And among my fellow countrymen, my name was not Homer, but Tigranes. Later on, when I was a hostage, Homer, among the Greeks, I changed my name. So his his name is literally eponymous. And he's saying, I'm my name's based on who I am. I'm a hostage. You know, Lucian also interestingly calls the Phoenician, well, the Phoenician capital shifted. I don't remember chronologically, which was the more prominent city first. We have Sir, which is spelled T-Y-R-E, and then you have Byblos, okay, the city yeah. of the book. Mm -hmm. Maybe even once we get the word Bible, <laughs> for all we know. But sure uh, Lu yeah. Lucian, Lucian called uh, Byblos Gabala, which is literally the word Kabala, but with a G. G yeah. and C interchange all the time, especially with Greek writers. So, and then in the, uh, I think Latin it is, Kabalus is a horse. So we know Kabbalah represents a secret initiatory stream of knowledge and information based largely on arithmetic and astrology and the doctrine of emanations, similar yeah. to Buddhism and other <laughs> Eastern things as well. So the fact that we're saying that you know, this Phoenician capital, Byblos, the book, city of the book is yeah. Gabala or Kabbalah. You know, that's Kabbalah cube. I've heard a lot of esotericists call it cube bala, yeah. you know, because the word book backwards phonetically is actually cube. Interesting. So we're talking about this square in the sky mm -hmm. that is a basically a book that has all these, you know, Pegasus related and other bi and biblical stories and Quran stories coming from a horse that is also a book it's kabbalah or gabala yeah. you know so yeah that's yeah I, again i'm sure there's a connection but the the so the the you know a, a great classical scholar named ml west just said it out right he just said that that there was no homer it was a it was a historical poet there was it wasn't a story co-poet he was a fictitious constructed name there's no original homer the hemorrhotidae uh, were not named after a person, but not knowing any better, they invented a Homer as their ancestor or founder. I'd like. Well, to that's go what with. Greeks loved to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they would like pick a whatever the name of a, a people or a group was. They they had a story where they had where those people had an ancestor whose name their group derived their title from. You know, commonplace. Yeah, around. and and I'm saying that Homer is actually probably a Babylonian or an Assyrian that he was maybe a Babylonian astrologer knew Lamashi writing was taken captive, brought to the Greeks, learned Greek, and then taught this system directly to the Greeks. And all of a sudden you have an alphabetic writing, you have Greek, you have uh, the, the Greek myths showing up, you know, starting with Homer and Hesiod. Well, that might have something related to yeah. the whole mythos of Cadmus, which it, bringing the alphabet to the Greeks, which is the same 16 letter alphabet as the Phoenician, the ancient Celts, uh, other groups yeah. as well, that those 16 letters are in a similar order. Uh, Hebrew QDM, yeah. which is like Cadmus is uh, also East, you know, so something yeah. from the East coming and teaching yeah. these letters. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and Walter Berker, an outstanding scholar, he was actually a friend of the, professor who taught me Akkadian. Um, and he said, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got cuneiform tablets, you, you've got, uh, you know, Aramaic, and you've got um, Greek all side by side in places that aren't anywhere near Mesopotamia. And you've, in Italy, as, even as far as Italy, you know, so he said, there's just, there's no, no way, th there's no other way to say it other than Greek literary practice is ultimately dependent on Mesopotamia. And I'm trying to condense because I have a lot of slides. So I'm trying to get to some of the uh, the takeaway of all this is simply that there's archaeological and textual record 
documents direct contact between Mesopotamia and Greek scholars throughout the 8th century BC. The ancient record implies that a Babylonian Tupshadu or astrologer had been taken hostage by a Hellenic satrap, right? And Lucian or Lucian claims that a vestige of the slave taking encounter remains in the eponymous title of the father of Greek epic poetry, Homer, hostage. He was a Babylonian hostage. That's that's my theory on how it happens, right? Can so, I uh, now? I know I'm throwing a lot of monkey riches in, but yeah, I want to yeah, also yeah. say that you know that there's a lot of confusion with. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying I have the answer, but that there's place names that get repeated. You know, there's uh, Rome is called Babylon in the Bible, for example, hmm. and there are multiple versions of uh, the same name showing up. I. I actually want to read a little bit from uh, Godfrey Higgins' Anacalypsis, where he says the author of Nimrod has shown that Babylon was built with a tower in the middle of it and square. Hmm. In, there's a square, the tower in the middle. Yeah. In imitation of Meru or the Indian city or their Ararat, Mount Ararat, where the ark lands, surrounded by streets making seven concentric squares of houses and seven spaces and 28 principal streets like the seven lands and seas of Meru and the eighth, the outward foss or Oceanus. <laughs> he has shown that the tower was formed upon seven towers, one above another, exactly as the Indian priest taught and imagined that the world was formed on belts of land and sea step by step to the Meru or North pole in the center at the top. Here appears to be a complete jumble of astronomy and mythology. The seven seas and Mount of the North, Isaiah's seat of the gods, were theological. The seven planets, astrological, and concealed from the vulgar. So he goes on to talk about how the author of Nimrod claims that Meru or the mountain is surrounded by paradise. And again, it has that square around the tower type of structure. You know, this is very much in line with the mythos of the Garden of Eden originating in the Pegasus Square. Um, and yeah. then various places you have in many many places religious groves or gardens are where the priests or the initiated will meet and hang out groves and gardens and i think this comes from the supposition that maru was attached to paradise uh you have the yeah. hanging gardens of babylon antioch syria in syria um <laughs> was built on seven hills so was rome uh, the gardens of Adonis at Byblos had this similar structure of like stacking things on each other, according to the, you know, the texts that I've read. I've never been there, or and I don't have a time travel machine, but I just find it fascinating, and you know that it's worth questioning the reason why there's more than one Babylon, more than one Troy, more than one Zion, uh, in that they proceed perhaps from a superstitious imitation of the idea of the first or original city. And also that when we're talking about flood mythos in particular, um, it's not necessarily recognized that the Genesis creation story is actually the Noah's Ark flood mythos. Even though they don't look the same on the surface level, we're talking about the creator God basically re re bringing humanity back. You know, it's replenish. It's not, it's not like the first time that this happened. So, you know, we have... This is one of the common themes, maybe most common themes that all mythos sort of spirals out of this protagon protagonist or first father, Adam, Noah, different versions of him, who all humanity issues from and yeah. his wife, Eve, who is also in a other sense, the androgynous other half of the one being. So <laughs> it gets confusing in that, you know, the idea was that every regeneration and every cycle the exact things might happen again, the exact way they happened before. So the, the story of Troy, Troy meaning three, by the way, Trinity, is going to repeat in exact detail in hmm. the future. So in that sense, the judicial astrology idea of reading the future and being able to read the past in a bizarre paradox, they're actually the same thing, the future and the past. Yeah. And the, the, I, I think, um, Chance, also there's a, the idea of celestial geography. Um, so that's another piece to this. Um, 
that certain constellations represent certain places on Earth, and uh, you 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 would have stories attached to those places, and they might be different stories about the same place. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I just just a thought as you. Were oh, talking. that's the, that's in the mix for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I want to, John. I think we're getting ready to start getting into the nitty gritty on yeah. uh, some of the. Lumashi in the Pegasus Square. Lots of great buildup for that. Can we wrap up on this slide? And yeah. if there's any other in between uh, starting the Pegasus Square decode proper, um, yeah. I want to do our intermission and and it come back if that's okay. We're yeah. roughly a little more than halfway through the slide. Yeah. So it seems like a good point. Great. Yeah. So just uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe oh, wrap sorry. up this so, yeah, slide for, and and, uh, okay. so and then the, we'll give your plugs and stuff and then we'll give we'll, we'll do our intermission. Yeah. So um, so the idea that um, the, the Mesopotamian idea that the sky was a hallowed text that imparted revelation through wordplay, that that's what the Sumerian uh, astrologers understood. Sumerian and Babylonian and Syrian astrologers, Mesopotamian astrologers saw that as the vehicle of explaining deep history, mythical history, uh, archetypal history. Um, and they conceptualized the constellations as heavenly writing that framed monumental historic events whose details were imparted through wordplay encrypted in the constellations, cuneiform spellings. Um, and I'm, I'm suggesting that that's the cipher which allows us to discern the astronomical origin of Pegasus and the myth, the myth recounting its birth. So. Very cool. Is that a, do you think this is a good? Yeah. Cool. I think so too. Good stopping point for, uh, we'll take about a three minute intermission, yeah. play some music, get up, go to the restroom, get some drinks. And uh, we're going to continue the conversation on, not on YouTube, but we will continue streaming on Rockfin. My Patreon will also receive the second hour of this chat. So hop on over. Rockfin's really worth, you know, joining, becoming a member of. They do such a better job supporting the content creators than YouTube does. <laughs> Would love to see. Uh, I know a lot of you will be there. Some of you are already transitioning over. Thanks for hanging out on the YouTube side. John, can you remind them all how they can connect with you, what work you have available for them to check out, and any other closing thoughts for the first half of the conversation so far? I mean, it feels like we were just building up to uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, help everyone have a strong ability to conceive of the logic and what we're really here to talk about, which is all these different iterations of mythos in the Pegasus Square. Super excited to get into that more granular aspect of the talk. Uh, yeah, let them, let them know where they can uh, get your work, buddy. Yeah, so the books, uh, The Celestial Code of Scripture, you can, uh, The Astral Cipher Underlying the Miracle Stories of the Bible of the Quran, you can, you can get it at uh, Amazon. Um, you can also uh, look up the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project. Uh, which was founded by my co-researcher named John Lundvall. And he's got an, some incredible video up regarding uh, the uh, Native American uh, archaeoastronomy and astral theology and the places that, that we go and we study and we visit, uh, mostly connected to rock art here in Utah. I'd love to get into that yeah. in a future talk. I, that's something I don't know as much about. Ironically, that's way closer to me geographically than yeah, all yeah. this European Middle Eastern stuff. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Well, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for being here. Hopefully it's okay with you that we might go a little longer to get through all the slides, but yeah. I, I'm so excited for all the great material you prepared for us. Extremely good in, oh, introduction <laughs> or refresher for those who are already familiar with it in the, this first half. And yeah, we'll see everybody over on uh, Rockfin, John, thanks for being here, and we'll be back after a couple minutes of intermission. Great. Okay, it's not really going to take six minutes, so you don't know why that timer says six minutes. <laughs> okay.